Welcome to episode 14 of the Better Than I Found It podcast. I'm Mike McGraw, the men's golf coach at Baylor University, and I'm very, very excited about my guest today, golf instructor Troy Denton from Dallas, Texas. In my opinion, Troy is one of the great young, and I use that term young instructors in the game today, and yet in many respects, he's an old school throwback. A throwback to a time when it wasn't just about technology or swing gurus or just things you have. It was about intuition, and Troy's got a lot of that. Today, you'll hear him talk about the need for simplicity with respect to in teaching, going back to old values relative to fundamentals, and also the need to play more golf. Uh, we'll get an insider's look at three great professionals he currently works with, guys you've all seen play. Troy is a living, breathing example of how someone can be dedicated to his craft and yet remain even more devoted to his family. His relative lack of ego and his humility are both really inspiring to me. Uh, there are just all the kinds of valuable nuggets packed into this episode. So I really hope you'll enjoy listening to Troy's philosophy. And I believe that if you take to heart what he's saying, you'll, you will be better and at more than just golf. Enjoy the episode. Thank you. Troy Denton, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I realize that uh, you don't do a lot of these. You don't do a lot of podcasts or interviews. And I know your time away from teaching the game is, is very valuable to you because you love family time so much. So Mikel and I just want to say thanks for spending an hour with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, and it'll be it'll be fun to do it. Yeah, Mikael. Yeah, thanks, Troy. I really enjoy getting to know you, and you're you're a great to young coach like myself. So can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, I'd like as is sort of a custom. You know, a lot of people like to know a background, how somebody grew up, what their influences were, different things like that. To, that kind of sent you toward golf. So. You know, first of all, where did you grow up? I started in uh, Dallas, Texas. I was born and raised here. And the funny thing is, I didn't play golf till I was 14 years old. So, and the, the strange part about it is my parents live on the 18th hole of Stevens Park Golf Course. Wow. So, it's kind of an ongoing joke. My dad's like, oh, I never understood why I lived here. Because he doesn't play golf. My brother doesn't play golf. My mom never played golf. So, you know, I played real competitive ice hockey. So I loved to rollerblade. So I'd go up there and rollerblade around the um, pro shop all the time to eventually where Jim Henderson, the head golf professional, which is still there now, he would kick me out of there. <laughs> so I was kind of like, well, maybe I should try golf. And this is 14, had never even crossed my mind or anything. So one day they have a thing called a junior card, which I think back then it was like $50 a year and you pay 50 cents every time you play. And man, after that, the rest was history. I mean, I started, I kept playing ice hockey to my freshman year, but I mean, I would play golf at Stevens Park literally every day, sun up to sun down until I had to go to hockey practice in the summer. Um, and then in the school year, obviously go to school, play golf till dark, then go to hockey practice. So it was, you know, it was a, it's a special place in my heart still. And that's actually where I, I got started teaching too. Wow. You know, it's, it's kind of unusual a guy takes the game up at that age and then plays college golf and spends his life in the game. Pretty rare nowadays. Yeah, and I would say, like, obviously I was a super late bloomer. I didn't get recruited to UNLV, too. I think I fully committed to – school's tough for me, so that kind of closed a couple doors for, like, TCU and East Tennessee State, just a few different places. And then Dwayne Knight gave me the opportunity at UNLV – so I don't think I committed there until after the AJGA Lucent Technologies that was at Lakewood. Um, so that's when, and that was my, that's why I tell some of my juniors now is that was my senior summer. So for kids who think like it's, you know, it's too late, that's not true. So, you know, I popped in the car and went to UNLV. So <laughs> that, That's great. pretty amazing. Uh, you got started late, you, you committed late. I mean, it was like you're always a little bit behind the, the curveball but you so you did play some pretty good junior golf though at even or yeah, you I wouldn't think, have been recruited by doing it was like it was at the golf week rankings is that what they had back then I was like top 50 on that and did good I, I just played I never won an AJGA played really consistent you know the course I grew up on 
didn't have a driving range at Stevens. So, I mean, I flat out just, he just went to the first tee and played all day. And we'll, we'll get into those details later for some of the juniors. But, like, I mean, I'm so thankful for that. And I kept things simple. You know, I obviously went and worked with, I did a few lessons with Randy Smith and a guy named Bruce Smith. And, but just was never, you know, it was a once a month type of thing. And not a lot, just flat out played with a bunch of old men and, played the game constantly, which I look back in some of the greatest times, you know, so I definitely played consistent, but nothing crazy, but had a good golf swing. And so obviously that gave me a good opportunity with Dwayne Knight gave me. That's great. Well, yeah. So your time at UNLV was, uh, was a turning point or a transformational point in your career, if you will, Be you, you were there from 2001 to 2006, but you had some pretty influential teammates. Uh, JC Deacon, the University of Florida golf coach is one of them and, and Ryan Moore. So talk a little bit about your experiences with them. Yeah, we all came in at the same time, um, which is pretty special. Ryan was number one in, you know, junior golf world rankings back then. And JC was probably like top 10. Like I said, I was probably like 30th to 50th or whatever it was. Um, I didn't actually know the guys very well, but obviously Ryan won everything. I could remember beating them in a, the Deleon, I think, team championship at, Northwood, I thought it was a big deal. Our team beat Ryan and his team, which I think his team was Michael Putnam. But uh, that was kind of all I knew about him back then, you know. Uh, so, I mean, we started – JC ended up being my roommate. So, we were in – you know, Ryan – and we also had Andre Gonzalez, too, a year later. So, he – you know, he's had a pretty good run and he's a pretty wild guy. But, uh, I mean, we all played golf daily, you know, and then, you know, it kind of escalated into other things with Ryan – which I coach now, but I mean, UNLV was an amazing opportunity. The thing I would say about UNLV where I went wrong is I played really well my first semester. And then once I found out I was going to red shirt, that's when it was like the opportunity of a lifetime for me. And which I thought then is like, you have pro V's on the most beautiful driving range at Southern Highlands you've ever seen in your life. And that's when I was like, Oh man, like if I want to be on tour, which I had obviously desires to do that. I was like, man, Number one is back then the big lie was like, you got to hit a cut to be on tour. That was number <laughs> one. And then number two is like, man, I'm going to learn to hit a cut and I'm going to hit a million golf balls. Forget playing. That doesn't matter. So then I just sat out there and just hit steep chops thinking that was the way you hit cuts and hit, hit balls to my heart's content. And next thing you know, I've seen a lot of different teachers. And before you know it, I just, if I could go back, I would just flip it and just play golf. I mean, I just, especially after, I still go, you know, that I work with Ryan Moore, I still play Shadow Creek a lot. I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I play that place every day. Like, he still hounds me on that. Like, what were you thinking? I'm like, I don't know. I should have played there every day. Well, you obviously learned a pretty good lesson because I know you use that in your teaching quite a bit today. But so uh, JC De Deacon, obviously a great player, Ryan Moore, great player. So you had good players around you. You had a great team to play on. That That's all part of what makes you a good player. But but really teaching came into the focus for you about this time. So talk about how that, I mean, this is very unusual. I haven't seen this happen for just about anybody actually. Yeah. You know, I was seeing a lot of different teachers, which, you know, is probably not the best thing, but while doing, I just had such a love for it. I even had a, not a lot of people know this, even print, you know, that's back before, you know, we had iPhones with those little Nokia's. So I even printed out a book of like the stuff I would go to Butch Harmon's guys printed out I would take like golf digest stuff and cut out like swing you know where they show the full swing uh through the through the full yeah through the full swing um and then you know what the craziest thing I did is I bought a, a swing software called c-swing that was like before even I mean v1 might have been around but I don't know how I got hooked onto that one then I started recording like Ryan Moore which I had a lot of footage for a long time before my computer crashed from back then but uh so pretty much from there, I just kind of fell in love with teaching. And, you know, next thing I know, you know, eventually Ryan called me for help, but that's kind of down the road, but wasn't the best thing for my golf, obviously, but it definitely started making me think about certain things and looking back to things that I did wrong that, you know, just got too deep into certain things that you can't, it's hard to get back out of, you know, unfortunately. Well, a lot of times, uh, you you learn through hard lessons you learn for yourself you actually can help other people with them and i i've seen that in coaching and i've seen it certainly in the teaching world a lot so 
it, it, it wasn't good for your golf that you went through those experiences, but it's probably great for your students today that you were able to do that back then because you probably won't allow them down that path. Absolutely. I talked to a lot of my juniors about that. Just there's, there's so many basic fundamentals that I can remember, you know, Ryan Moore can tell you this story. We, we hit a first day we we're at UNLV. We got on the first tee at Las Vegas country club and just a little dog leg left to right. He gets up there, hits it down the middle. Then he's standing behind me when I tee off and there's this tree off to the right. And I get up there and he didn't tell me this two years later, I was aimed at that tree. So it was like 20, 15 yards right, pull it right down the fairway, then cut it right back to the right side of it. And I thought it was the greatest shot ever. No big deal. He's like, later on, he's like, I was like looking, I'm like, did he know some secret, you know, of like that I didn't know or something. And then it's like, but the point being on that is like, I had the worst alignment in the world, but I thought, man, if I have the perfect backswing, if I have, you know, if I can figure this out, it's just going to be, you know, perfect rather than I had these old men at Stevens park that used to even tell me that Troy, your alignment's you know, aim to the right, you should fix that. But I was like, nah, that doesn't matter. I gotta make my swing look perfect. And then if I get my backswing perfect, obviously everything else is gonna be perfect. So there was not a lot of talk of sequence through the golf ball at all. It was just how good can, and that was the era I grew up in too, you know? Well, uh, again, you're learning lessons as you go oh, yeah. through. Uh, yeah. So you said Ryan thought about that, saw it, didn't tell you about it until years later. How did the two of you actually get into a relationship where he, I mean, why did he come to you for help at one point? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we played golf number one every single day, almost me, JC Deacon off and on, but me, Andre Gonzalez and Ryan Moore played every single day, pretty much, you know, that might be nine or 18 holes, but that was pretty much our group. We'd go get, go to school in the morning, get lunch and then play golf to dark, you know? So I just think, you know, we, and I spent a ridiculous amount of time in college and just talking golf because I was just obsessed with it. Even though I was struggling and not playing, I was always, you know, passionate about it, working hard, um, watching him hit, got him hit golf balls and practice, videoing his swing and, uh, and some of the other guys. And so, you know, I think down the road, I went and tried to play mini tours, which, you know, kind of like everyone does. And I think everyone should chase it and, you know, at least find out if you can or not so you can let that go. So. He called me one day and said, hey, Troy, like, you know, he's worked mostly with his dad always, but he just knew my passion for the game and our friendship. He's like, hey, you know, I, I need someone that I trust and someone that can kind of help me with all aspects of the game because there, there's a lot more to it with the tour players. I'm just, oh, perfect swing. There's a lot of, like, scheduling equipment because I have a passion for all this stuff too, you know, like, hey, when should I take all days off? How many tournaments should I play in a row? um just the mindset and different stuff and he knew I loved all that and I've always been a big supporter of him so he's like hey do you want to you want to do this and so I was like absolutely so I played a few mini tour events when I first started working because obviously I had a, a strange road where a lot of people you know learn under some teacher I never really did that I respect tons of teachers and I research them but I never got like mentored under a teacher I really got out there and looked what guys were doing and kind of Honestly, Ryan has taught me as much as I've worked, it helped him, you know, like I've helped him in a lot of different areas, but he's obviously one of the most gifted golfers I've ever met. I mean, he's golf brilliant. So from there, we just kind of ran with it and we had a really good run and I still think he's got some in the tank, you know, and we can get, get into that a little later though. Well, that's interesting that uh, your biggest influence, if, if I'm hearing you right, in teaching was probably a player that you're working with as opposed to other teachers. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Because like, I mean, like I said, he's golf brilliant. You know, I helped him with things, but man, like his mind, like just we process to this day when we have a conversation every few days, just pretty, I mean, he's very deep thinker of the way he goes about it, his equipment companies, his schedule. I mean, it's, it's very deep thinking. So we've been talking that for, I don't even know, like 14 years now or so, like 12, 14 years. It's crazy. Wow. You know, he, uh, in some ways as a player, he reminds me of you as a teacher because both of you play or you carry yourselves with sort of a lack of ego. Now that, that may not be completely true because I don't know what's inside you, Troy, but, but on the outside, when we watch you and see you and talk to you, you, you have a humility about you that's very refreshing, especially in this profession where, I mean, if I want to become a great instructor, I have to be known and I have to have an academy and I have to sell 
videos and I have to, I mean, I have to do a lot of things that are pretty egocentric. And I know you're an, you're a human, so you've got an ego as well, but, and I know Ryan is a hu human, he's got one as a player, but you both seem to be pretty humble about what you do. Yeah, I don't know. I think the teaching business is tough in the sense at the tour level that, I mean, just like I had a good run with Kelly Craft and, you know, that comes in end, but you know what, like I sent them a message the other day on Instagram, man, your swing's looking great. I see him in the neighborhood. We live in the same neighborhood. I see him at the course. It's just like, you kind of learn early on. I mean, there's definitely a time when you're like, ah, I failed that guy. Kind of makes me sad. Um, things like that. But then you realize too, these guys are just trying to be their best. So, you know, and we're, we're, let's just be honest. Like we're kind of saying, we're helping these guys fractionally. They were, Kelly was good at SMU. I think he won the transmiss. He won the US Amateur. Like, and he kind of got a little lost and you help him get on track. It's just like these guys. So I, I think I learned early that, I mean, you can't be prideful for that stuff. You have to encourage them. And then too, you don't know when there might, you know, there's no secrets out there. Let's just be honest. It's one of those deals where there's a lot of teachers that love to pretend there is. And there's definitely uh, personalities that people blend with. That's very important. And I think obviously Sebastian Munoz, Will Zaltoris, Ryan Moore, um, then I've obviously worked with other other guys that have blend, but then sometimes there's injuries, there's different things. But I think you just learn that, man, you just try to do your best for people and that. And to be honest, I'm just not a guy that I want to be on Golf Channel and, you know, do do a bunch of podcasts like this. <laughs> obviously, for you guys, I'd love to, but I don't know. I just like to teach and I don't like to do group teaching. I like to do one-on-one -on -one and just, you know, get to know my players well and bond with them. That could be members, juniors. Um, so that's just kind of my style, you know? Well, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, we can't take too much credit. You don't want to be prideful about this. That same bit of advice goes to college golf coaches. So I know a lot of college golf coaches are out there listening to this podcast today and, I think they need to be reminded of the same thing, the same way I am. People want to tell you, oh, you've coached him and him and him and him. Well, yeah, I mean, I did. Our paths crossed. We spent time together and it wasn't perfect every day. Oh, yeah. So I, I appreciate that about you a lot because I think with that humility comes a lot of uh, learning because you're humble enough to learn from a player. I mean, that's that's crazy. That's so flipped uh, with the model that's out there today. You know, if you can see what I'm saying. Absolutely. Like, I think Ryan's just a special one that, like, I'm just, he's the deepest thinker of how, when I say thinker, it's just not as golf swing. It's, it's, it's how he does everything. I mean, that's why he, you know, he went a year without sponsors. You know, he chose to not take, because he had to find himself of kind of, he was a little lost in his, you know, he's, he's never been far off, but he just didn't have quite as good a year. And he kind of felt like he needed to find himself. And, he just has a different way of looking at everything and just I've learned a tremendous amount from him. Absolutely. Oh, I think that's fantastic to hear. To I really do. And, you know, and he opened the door for my teaching. It's huge because, you know, you have to have a little trust, you know, but at the same time, you're never going to get a lot of credit from him too. Cause everyone's like, well, his swing's weird. Da, da, da. But actually, I mean, he has one of the best body motions to the golf ball possible and face control. So it's kind of one of those deals where it's like, and then the way he he never makes a mistake where he's on a par five and he has, you know, he's not the longest hitter, you know, he has 265 over water and he may be able to do that, but he absolutely like I've never once got on the phone and be like, man, like that probably wasn't the best choice right there. You know, maybe a day or two later, I'm not going to do that right after a tournament, but he just, he doesn't make those mistakes. It's crazy. Like, it, yeah, it's incredible. That's pretty easy to work with a guy like that too, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's it's very, very refreshing to hear that you're learning from your players. Let's talk about a few of those players. You mentioned them earlier, but Ryan Moore, Will Zalatoris, who's currently number one on the Corn Ferry Tour, and Sebastian Munoz, who's just had a huge amount of success playing. So those are three of the guys you work with. But what's beautiful about that to me is they all have completely different looks in their golf swing. So... Mikkel, you and I were talking about this, and Mikkel, chime in right now if you would. There's a genius in there. Now you're gonna, you're not gonna say that, um, but there is a genius in there about allowing three guys that do it differently to all succeed. I just think it's so interesting uh, that they have these different looks, yet they're 
successful and getting more and more successful they're progressing in the right way yet you can't see on the surface exactly like okay this is definitely troy putting his stamp on you know he has a certain look he wants all his players to fit into there's no sort of mold yeah you know it's one of those deals where like you know, Sebastian Munoz, I'll start with him. Like, he was one of the, like, he was a very special one to me because it was kind of, I mean, obviously he played at North Texas. He wasn't known as a player. He has an amazing story. Um, he didn't even think he was going to play professional golf. He said his final senior year, if I win a tournament, I think maybe even said, yeah, if I win two tournaments, I'll try to play from Columbia, won two tournaments. Um, then got an opportunity, played some tournament in Columbia that got him into Corn Ferry that's in Columbia, won it. Bam. Like, I mean, it's incredible. And I totally get it now because he has an extremely special mind for golf in the sense of he can just go mindless, which, you know, I didn't teach him that, you know. Um, he just is a natural gift. But, you know, going forward, he got on tour and just got completely lost. You know, he's chasing new drivers, new – he played every single week, never took a break. Um, his golf swing aimed right, just got steep over the top. The sequence was terrible, nothing crazy. Um, had his own unique swing, you know, wasn't encouraged the right way, had no one to talk to, you know, constantly. He still, I mean, he calls me almost every day. I'm like, oh, how's the swing today? He's like, no, I wasn't calling for that. What are you doing? Da, 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 you know, just wants to talk about different things because that's a huge part of the tour life. But, anyways, like what's special to me is getting, you know, I've had you know, four of Ryan's five wins on tour with him, so which is really special, but to finally get a win with another player and to see the success Sebastian has is huge, you know, and we, when he first came to me, I kind of put together like a three week, two to three week boot camp because he was going to head back to Columbia. I was like, look, here's, here's our game plan. This is what we're going to do. Um, we made those changes. He hated it. And there weren't crazy changes. There were a lot of alignment sequencing and different things that kind of work together. Um, but just understanding those and then giving them the constant belief, like, look, Sebastian, like you are Sebastian Munoz, you are not this golfer, or this golfer, or that. And I still have to kind of talk to him about to this day is you are that good. And, you know, you have to be who you are. Um, and we ran with that and had huge, I think he finished seventh on the corn Ferry tour the following year at just super consistent. Like he had never played consistent golf in his life. He was a 64 74 type of guy he has the ability to go brainless which you can't teach then we got on tour then it was a little bit of a battle not a battle but just that first time keeping your card is for any guy for you know for certain guys it's different wheels out towards a little different but for Munoz that that was going to be the thing that made him believe he belonged so by him finally keeping that card which we came down I think he finished 125th that's the crazy part about it I mean, even hitting into the left woods at the final hole, the wind of miles freaking out. I was like, oh gosh, this is the make or break right here. And he battled through it. But man, from there, the rest is history because we've kept after the same things. We've had to work super hard on his mindset and accepting certain things. Like I'll go into a little inside of that because I think it help people. It's like the flat out, I don't want him at the golf course hardly at all. He cannot go on Mondays at a tour event. Absolutely, it's death. Tuesdays has to just get out of the golf course, play, get out of there. Wednesday, you know, on a, on a Tuesday, I don't want him playing nine at the most. You can't even let him hit many balls. And then on Wednesday, play the pro am when the, when there hasn't been programs lately. That's been a little tough, but get out of there. And even because he will self sabotage. I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's just he thinks that he has to work like be like other tour players. And if you don't work for seven hours a day, you're not going to be great, which is the biggest lie in the world, which is another thing I learned from Ryan. But so we've kind of learned our system. And I even, he called me last night, you know, had a great week last week um, at Shadow Creek finished ninth. And he's like, man, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are just brutal. Like <laughs> just boring. They have zero, like they don't excite him. So if he goes out there and he's not excited, he'll judge his golf game and get discouraged and try to find things that he doesn't need to man. When the T when he tees it up, that excites him. So it's like, we've learned a lot of different things and, you know, obviously finishing eighth in FedEx cup was huge, you know, probably make the right uh, Olympics this year, just on and on, but he, he appreciates it so much. And I really think like, I mean, he's a player that people don't understand. He just has a natural gift that if we don't mess with it, it's just going to keep going.
you know, and we're not, we're not trying to find new secrets or, you know, I have to, I actually have to rein him back more than, you know, try to give him new stuff, you know? So it's, it's an interesting thing. Well, I think two things there that occur to me, one, that is coaching. Sometimes doing less is coaching, but it also takes a, a great amount of uh, ego check because you think he's, he's got to hear something new every time you think he thinks he's got to hear it. And honestly, you don't have to have that. And so less is a whole lot more right there with him and the success is showing. Yeah, absolutely. For, that's, that's a fact for him. Um, so you've talked about Ryan Moore, uh, Sebastian, that's a great story, but tell us a little bit more about Wills Altoris, a, a kid in Dallas. He was a, a podcaster here a couple of weeks ago for us, and I really enjoyed hearing his story, but how about the story between you and him? Yeah, Will, Will was one I never even, he joined Merido where I teach and I love, um, uh, Merido Golf Club. And as well as Dill, I saw him out there and I always admired him. Like I, you know known his name in Dallas and different things, but never, you know, never thought I'd probably get the opportunity to work with him or he'd come by. Just one of those things you just don't know. You don't think a lot about, but I always thought, man, this kid's good. I, I like his attitude. You know, I'm judging this by Twitter and different things, but I just, I just liked him. So when he joined Merida after turning pro early from Wake Forest, he just, I was working with Martin Flores at the time. So he would see me out there with him. And then just finally, he just kind of wanted to a little different view on things and different stuff. So we kind of went for it. And I mean, it's been incredible with him, but at first he was kind of at a point to where he just wasn't confident. You know, it wasn't that he still hit it good, different things. We were still trying to work the short putter. And at that time it was one of those deals where I was like, okay, I think he's an incredible putter. When you see him on the putting green with a short putter, you're like, ah, okay, like I can do this, which, you know, a lot of people probably tried to help him with that. And so you're kind of like, yeah, like I'm gonna make this work, and I'm surprised no one else had that. You know, and and but then, man, when you got him in a tournament, it was different. So I had an arm lean putter from I had one built up from Callaway for the National Club Pro like a while back, and I was just finally to the point to where because obviously he always hits it good statistically. You know, he's kept his stats since a young boy with Scott Fawcett, and I mean he he's always statistically hit it great. Um, but he just was kind of in a place where there wasn't a lot of belief, um, thought he had to make a lot of changes because he has a couple of very unique things in a swing where it's like, man, if you post one on Instagram, people are like, why don't you fix this, this or that? And now I would say there was a time I was like, well, maybe we'll get to that. We'll see. But now I'd absolutely say no, because we've, he, he's fully has the belief. We worked a couple hours yesterday and it's like, there's just way more to it than the golf swing, but now he has that belief in different things, but on the, not to lose track on the putter, but once he switched that arm lean, I mean, it just changed just the consistency of his setup and stuff. So, I mean, he's ran, ran with that once he's, but then that's given him a lot more confidence in the, uh, the golf swing too, and the belief. And then too, it's just like, we, it's kind of like all my guys, it's just the quality time we spend together. It's not just about the golf swing, you know, I mean, yeah, you could fix his left wrist and make it pretty, but then that also could destroy him when every person in the world thinks, Oh, why is he cupping a little bit coming down? Oh my gosh. Like, Oh, how do you not fix that? That's so easy. Well, go ahead. I mean, if you watch him hit golf balls and you see the results and the, the fun thing that he said to me is recently was at the U S open, he obviously had a great result as he said, he was on like the fourth hole and, uh, he kind of looked around. He's like, I belong out here. And that's when wow. that was kind of his, you know, that's why I was getting to Sebastian was keeping his card. I truly believe uh, Will's out Taurus was right there. Like, I think he realized like, wow, number one, he's the most passionate lover of golf that I've ever met. And what I mean, that is every, he could be on the road for 14 weeks straight. And I'm like, okay, we're not going to see him for a week. This would be a great thing. And this is a good example is last week. Nope. Next day. I'm like, why is Will's car here? out playing with Tony Romo with whoever Mike Ball and all his buddies and different stuff. And we played golf on Monday this week. Like the guy just flat out there was, if he wasn't a tour player, he'd be like the mid am guy playing golf after work every single day. So it's like, you, you can't not admire that, but you know, my deal with him is just like, I'm trying to just make him the same thing, believe that he doesn't, he could be who he is right now. And he's going to be top 10 in the world. Like he's that, he's that naturally gifted. Now there's certain things with scheduling, proper rest, 
finding that belief that that's the stuff we're kind of working on. Well, I love hearing that. That is so good. You know, uh, you were mentioning uh, things in his golf swing that people yeah. say, you need to fix that. You need to fix the best advice I ever had from a really good instructor years and years ago was, oh, they don't like that position he's in right there. How, and they say, you've got to fix it. How do you know that's not what makes him great? That might be the very thing in his golf swing that actually makes him great. I actually talk about one position with him every time. Cause we have little, like I'm a huge person on like offsetting people's patterns. Like I believe we don't fix patterns fully. And first of all, most of your plant, you're working with high level players. They're not broken to start with. Okay. Let's just be honest. You could, I joke with people, you could go to, you could have a bad day, go to bed, never hit a golf ball, wake up the next day, and they may be back into timing and sequence, and they may shoot 65 and think they're the greatest golfer in the world again. Or you could have gone to the range after the round, hit balls for two hours. You get one field, they go in the first hole, that field doesn't work. Well, then they're just like, I don't care. I'm just going to play golf. Then they play good. It's just, it's sometimes to me, it's more of a waste of time than it does. Now, I do believe in like, once we identify patterns, you can learn to offset like like Will constantly has to feel like he's hitting high draws on an off week to stay in sequence, to stay shallow, to get his ball start because he loves to hit little squeeze fades, which is absolutely, he will play that the rest of his life. But if he plays squeeze fades for 14 weeks, you know, and then he's not offsetting somewhere in there, it can get a little, get a little crazy, even though he's still going to play good golf. But, you know, it, it's the whole deal where like him, I mean, I know the stuff that I can, I, yeah, I'd love to like, it's even crossed my mind, but when you watch them hit golf balls at some point, it's just like, man, that's just as much risk fixing. No, that wrist angle, which every person on Instagram thinks like, Oh, if you don't do it that way, it's never going to work. It's just, that's just not the case, you know, For, especially when the results are already there and he can work the golf ball and do things with a golf ball that I mean, flat out, like you can't teach like you. And I actually was talking to him about yesterday. I was kind of like, how do you, I want to know for my son one day or for even juniors I teach, he's like, how did you learn how to maneuver the golf ball? Like he can just total instinct. And he really thinks it, you know, it was from, you know, his coach young David price is just like, was at the top of his back. So he'd call draw, call fade, you know, that old, old fashioned drill. But to this day, I mean, like, to be honest, you know, this could another conversation, but kids today, you know, with TrackMan and everything, and technology is great. I love it, but you got to use it the right way. It's just they're they're not doing that anymore. You know, and I'm at fault of that as a teacher sometimes, getting people too neutral, and that's why I was literally asking that to learn from them yesterday. It's like it's so true. It's like we just we don't do that as much anymore. We don't play golf as much. You know, it's more just training. So yeah, he's a special one. Yeah, he really is. And I, I've so enjoyed getting to know him through the years and was thankful he came on a couple of weeks ago on this podcast. But he is a special player for sure. And and I think a special player with a special teacher, some special things can happen. So I think that's great. Um, but you just mentioned technology. So let's let's just briefly discuss how you use technology. I know you're a, a fan of it, but you're a fan of it used properly. So yeah. I'm never going to claim that I'm like, th there's guys out there that are absolutely brilliant with this stuff and they spend hours and days of researching and know. So like, you know, like the 3d, there was a point where I was like, Oh, I wanted to get, I got a my swing 3d. Then you realize real quick. It's like, okay, well, well, this guy does this and this one does that. And it's like, well, all these guys play it, but like, how do you know what's right or wrong? So like, I kind of leave that for, that's going to be a last resort, I guess, is what I'm saying in the sense of 3D. And it's great to, you you know, a lot of guys have teams now where they go to TPI. I just think it's better left for those guys are a lot more brilliant than I am. You know, I'm looking at the ball flight, the sequencing of the body, the alignment, which has just such mass, massive factors on your, on your sequencing. Um, and then the overall thinking of the game. But, you know, I love track, man. It's just nice to know club path, face angle, angle attack. Um you know, your distances, there's just so many things, your driver fitting, your spin, your launch, all, all those typical things. But I still tell people all the time is like, man, I, I'd call that machine like pretty accurate, but dude, you just don't live and die by it. You know, it's like, you know, like we, I love TrackMan, but it's just, they're doing their best. But one day we may find their stuff on there that's completely wrong. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, all those old Lee Trevino, all those guys, they did okay without it, you know, but that's basically, and I've done a little like things with K-Vest and different things, but at the end of the day, I just find that's like, 
I would say it probably confuses people a little bit more than really, really helps. And I get, I'd rather probably seek out someone for help on some of that, but I mean, I, I use my trackman all the time. So, but other stuff, I'm kind of like, man, like that's a last resort in a sense, you like, know, obviously video constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously to, there are tools out there available and you're going to use those to your advantage. I still think Ben Hogan would have used TrackMan if it was available. Absolutely. Without question. But he would have been smarter than most guys who are using it with the way he would apply it to his own game. So. Yeah. And that's what I think people don't realize too is like at the tour events, I mean, there really is like 14 TrackMans, 15, 10 on the range every single hour of it. It's incredible now. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of foresight quads now, but like most of the guys you're seeing use them literally are getting their carry yardage normalized. Mm -hmm. that's the crazy part is it's like so from the outside you're like oh man like i have a junior right now who wants to buy one and i have a person who's selling theirs and i'm like why do you want this <laughs> <laughs> like i don't even like when i rarely go practice now i don't even take mine out because i'm like i just want to see my ball flight and hit balls you know it's like i don't need to i get for the tour guys like why wouldn't you purchase that for a write-off and different things but you're just better off leaving that to your coach or if you're using it for the, the yardages and the games and different stuff like that, it's great. But yeah, it's, there's just going to be more stuff, I, it, you know, and it's just like all of us, it's the things we think we're teaching something that's like so brilliant. No one's going to ever didn't teach and someone that like they didn't know. And there's going to be things we find out that were completely wrong. You know, it, it's funny as a teacher, you always look back and you're like, Oh, that was a, uh, that wasn't right. <laughs> but that guy still won. <laughs> well, you know, heart surgery is a lot different than it was 50 years ago, probably barbaric 50 years ago. So things evolve, things change. So I, I'm cer certain your teaching has too. So give me probably the greatest example of how your teaching has changed from 15 years ago to now or 10 years ago to now. Yeah, I'd say number one is just finally understanding like I really alignment means a lot to me because you'd be amazed like if you can't align properly your body can't work properly. And, and then nowadays, like I truly believe, you know, we want to shallow the shaft in general and we want to use our body to control the face. So it's kind of like, and you can hit a draw or fade from there, but it's like having the proper alignment for the shots. It's like, cause you'd be amazed at people. It's just still not fancy enough, you know, alignment. And there's people out there that alignment don't have, doesn't have that big a factor. But when I think they say that, I think they're saying like, like Ryan always aimed, left i think the, the third meaning is he didn't line up perfect but him lining left matched his pattern so it's like you get so many of these guys they'll come in and they're right aimers well that's going to make and they don't know they're aimed right that's going to completely destroy the sequence of their body they're going to get up and out of it even if like i mean sebastian munoz is a perfect case i mean he aimed about 10 yards right to 12 yards right every time and he hit a he stood up on it which we still work on constantly. And he swung probably two to four or five degrees across his body, hit a little pull fade. And he could play great golf from there. But man, when it got off, they would break down. So literally a guy like that, we got him proper alignment, started learning how to drive the ball down the target line with good rotation, which will basically offset each other. And he had a pretty neutral ball flight, but it's like, and then he actually could stay in his posture control his face and go from there so I just find that like that's probably the core of my concern and I get there's there's guys out there that know and you know and proper wrist tangles and things I get all that stuff but it's like that you know Will's out torch doesn't have the proper wrist angle till knee high but it works pretty good so it's kind of like it's the same thing as like I, I just as a teacher don't think I can ever be like that's why I don't do swing seminars and stand up in front of people because man like I don't have the perfect answers but I do know the basic stuff people don't go. It doesn't, I've never heard a player. I mean, I, I personally think this because I gave them something crazy, you know, like I risked something huge on them because I had this theory, you know, I, I personally don't think I have, maybe they think different, but I mean, that'd be for another day, but the, it, it just, the stuff I'm giving them is not risky, I guess, is the way basically, you know, I'm trying to just control their club face with their body, have good club pass and align properly and go from there. Yeah. Well, and, and you're talking about one of the main fundamentals that I've been taught my whole life too, just alignment. And so you're teaching that to Will and Ryan and Sebastian, but it's all applied a little bit differently because of their path, their swing, their body. 
it's it's different for them, but you're able to take the same fundamental and apply it to different players with different swings. Absolutely, yeah. You know, Sebastian and Will have they're a little bit more than the same, and then Ryan's absolute opposite of them of, of like the offsetting patterns and the alignment. Absolutely different. You know, Will uh, Munoz are right aimers, and then uh, Ryan's left. And then their patterns are total opposite. You know, Munoz and uh, Willie Z can be a little bit more pull cutters, a little on the steeper side. And, and uh, Ryan's always been a pusher. So it's kind of, you know, and he'll drive it down his target line, then fade it off of it, and, you know, at his best. So, Well, that's all interesting stuff. And I do appreciate the way you teach the game. I'm going to call it old school, if you will, uh, because – it does have a feel with that and it's great. And I know it works. So that's great. But one of the things you do that's interesting is you still work at golf. You still try to be a player. And so I, I want you to just talk about how that passion you have of still wanting to be a good player, how it helps you in the teaching world and when you're working with your players. Yeah, I still think it's super important. Now this year I have not played. This is the first year of my life that I haven't played every section event for the most part. I just love to do it. That's a little bit to do with my son has a lot of hockey and my daughter and, you know, has been busier than ever weirdly with COVID and different things. It's just, and then some of my tournaments conflicted with the tour events this year because they got moved. Um, but I just think what I, I always tell people, it's just good examples. Like, let's say I give a person all this technique on their backswing. Okay. I can remember thinking like, man, I'm going to take this. I can't wait to go to the course this afternoon. I'm going to shoot 65. And you go out there and you hit a couple of yippy shots and you're like, oh my gosh, like shoot 85 or whatever, you know, you, you struggle because you, you're gave someone, you know, so technical that that's just a good reminder. Cause I think some teachers that don't play, they forget that like, yeah, Hey, feel your right elbow tuck, your left wrist flex and rotate with your hips and go the first tee and do that. So I always tell people, look, we're going to train that here. And then that's in our offsetter, and this is a, a range drill. When we go play, we still got to just go play golf, you know. It's, and then we'll, over time, let's let it blend naturally. You know, that's that's my belief. I think that belief has happened from millions of times, thinking that I'm going to go take this right away on the course, and next, thing you know, you can't play the game. So I think it's a reminder. I think short game shots too. You're in the rough, and you got to use the bounce, and you know what it feels like when you need to get it up and down. You're playing a tournament, you feel those nerves. So it just reminds you that number one, things aren't that easy. And then also too, to be careful with like giving playing fields and having drills and playing fields. They're two different things to me. You know, like everyone has a playing field. That's like, you have a trust, but we really develop those more on the course. And the, I call them player fields too. It's like, they have a field that might not be real or whatever, but that field makes them feel comfortable and believe, you know, and, and that I could, Sometimes I can give that to them. Sometimes that's up to them. And that's like, I'm not going to be prideful in that because that's more important than me thinking that's like, oh, that's not what I told them. It doesn't matter. And it might not even be correct. That's the funny part, but that feel produces, gives them a full trust. So I think playing, number one, it's fun. And then two, I still have a desire. This year has been slowed down, but I would like to compete at a national club pro and play in a PGA championship. And we have a tournament in our section, an NTPGA that, if you win, you can get into the Byron Nelson. So those are things I just think will be fun things to look back. And I know I can do from my past, but, you know, I just need to practice a little more this year. It's been a, it's been a, I don't need a lot of practice. I just need to play once a week. So, and I can do that if I choose to do it. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you learn the game playing, not hitting balls anyway. You learn yeah. the game playing. Better. You know, if you keep that attitude, and I've always said that enthusiasm in golf is very important. It's like a 15th club in a golf bag if you have enthusiasm. So you obviously love playing the game. With your son, Finn, coming up, you know, maybe he starts to play a little more golf. Maybe that'll give you a reason to get out there. Absolutely. I think I think that will be. And then, too, is I just I just need to do a better job of it. I've talked to everyone in my club about this. They give me a hard time. It's just you just have to, as a teacher, maybe it's my old school, like you're saying, is like I just don't say no to anyone. So the next thing you know, I have this day blocked and, you know, I have it blocked. I'm planning on playing. And then someone's like, Oh, I really need to get in this day. And I'm just that guy. That's like, okay, next thing you know, you have five lessons and it's like, okay, like I can wait another week. It doesn't really matter or whatever. So usually I do that, but then I just play every tournament. Just, I love the place. So I just, I'll just go in there not practicing a lot, but I think you're right. I think as my son gets older and you know, if he loves the game or likes it, that'll open 
you know, a lot of opportunity to play more. So I think it's just the timing. And next year I am going to play more. So you can good, good. back to me next year and see. <laughs> well, speaking of people who are playing, um, you do teach a lot of junior golfers and you teach some professionals, but tell me if you were going to give before we're, we're going to have one more thing that we're going to have in this podcast, that'd be a speed round, which I haven't prepared you for. So we'll see how quickly you act on your feet. But um, what's your best advice? One piece of advice you think would be valuable for a junior golfer coming up today? Yeah. Less is more. That's, that's, I mean, that's just truthful. Like I think everyone nowadays just thinks you have to do, and I get it as a parent now, I'll go in a little detail because my son's playing hockey and he loves it. So I'm like, well, who's the best coach? Who's this? And then sometimes that reminds me for my teaching. I'm like, man, like I would never tell a parent, like he's not playing enough golf. So they need to play golf and just realize that you don't need a track, man. You don't need that. Just be passionate to play the game and less is more. I mean, truthfully, it's just getting out there and you're playing and learning to be passionate to shoot a score, like having a desire if your course record personally is 76, I'll shoot a 75. I mean, you know, and that's my, it'd be advice to myself if I could go back and talk to my college self, you know, be like, play golf. I mean, I think every person will look back. You would never regret playing a ton in college or junior golf. You will regret if you look back and you're my age or some, so, and you'd be like, man, I just wish I would have played more because that's probably my biggest regret in college, to be honest. Um, actually the advice you just gave for juniors would work for professionals, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Like, and I think if you really, I think they show one thing from the outside, but I think if you really talk to Roy Macro and a lot of these guys, like, yes, they do work hard. Don't get me wrong, but they work very quality and they're not, they're not hitting balls for seven hours or doing this or that. It, it, it looks a one way, but it's not, I, I truthfully believe. That's great. That's great. Well, Troy, I really appreciate the wisdom you brought today. Um, and the fact that you don't do a lot of these was pretty humbling to Coach McKell and I because we, we felt like this is a pretty big day for us to get to hear this. And, and me being old school, it was kind of cool to hear some of the things you had to say as well. Yeah, no, thanks for letting me be on. It's fun. But now I'm going to put you on the spot. Right, let's hear it. Let's hear it. got about 10 questions oh, for you in this speed round. So here they are. And nothing too controversial yeah. here all right here we go your son finn is an avid hockey player obviously who's his favorite pro hockey player um stephen johns okay how many of your players can you beat right now currently that you work with zero okay one out of ten rounds all right fair enough because they're, 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 all all they're, they're tough favorite movie of all time oh maybe gladiator oh good one good one all right now this is a two-part question your favorite golf swing in professional golf, aesthetically speaking, and then your favorite functionality speaking. So just give two that you just think are, and they don't have to be the same. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd say Louis. I love Louis swing probably in his early time, like not maybe not as much now, but just early on. I think it was just the freest, no thought, no, no care whatsoever. Yep. And then it's like a functionally swing. I mean, it's hard not to love Ryan's. I mean, okay. just year i mean it's just it really is because over years like uh going to fraction detail it's just i swear he's never hit a ball foul ball hmm. like when we're playing you know played i've never just seen him hit one in the gutch so <laughs> that's pretty functional isn't it so yeah yeah he's just freak pace control yeah all right we just played merido in the merido collegiate this week and you saw the scores and you saw the conditions what number of man would you have played on the Baylor golf team this week? Bench. <laughs> okay. I don't that believe that. That That'd be tough. Okay. Uh, Ryan Moore's summer of 2004, is that the best you've ever seen? Yes. Like he, he I mean, it was flawless. Like he, like if, if he was a more popular golfer in a sense of more self-promoting and, uh, willing to do more things it would be a lot more known he's just so like you said earlier in the podcast just humble and it's not worried about it and just doesn't i, mean, I don't want to say doesn't care but just that doesn't light his fire in a sense so like yeah he won literally i think it was 12 because you have to count in what a lot of people don't really it's the holly championship first college turn in the year regionals our conference regionals and that he won like 12 straight like if you put them even the core of the summer there was tournaments before he got to the summer 
and then at, at the beginning of the following season. So, yeah, it was like I, I just don't think anyone will ever do that like in college golf. Pretty amazing. Okay, Will Zaltors was a podcaster a couple of weeks ago. Give me one thing about him that he didn't tell us that we need to know about Will. Ooh. Let's see. That's a good one. I got to think of something good. <sighs> is he that bland? Is, is there's got to be something? I'm just trying to think of something good. I would say that people have, no, I mean, just like I, I hit on already, is like people have no clue. Like he literally might play 18 holes every single day. Like, I'm just talking, like, it's rare he doesn't play golf. It's incredible. Like, I, I'm blown away by that still of him. But, yeah. Okay, just a golf nerd that has enthusiasm to get He's out there every day. Straight up the greatest golf nerd ever. I love him. <laughs> I love hearing that. Okay, final question. Your go-to order at Chipotle? Oh, man, it rotates. But a, a, a burrito bowl, a bowl, large diet, Coke, chips, everything. I rotate. <laughs> I crush that place. No one's <laughs> ate there more than me. I think Mikhail might, and I might have that for lunch today. Who knows? But I got records. I'm going right after this for sure. So perfect, you guys. <laughs> Mikhail, say your goodbyes to to Troy here. Hey Troy, I want to be like you when I grow up. You're uh, the coolest. Thanks for coming on. Thank you guys. It was fun. Troy, thanks again. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work that you're doing. We we love watching. Sounds good. Thank you guys. Uh huh. Yeah.